So I'm not sure if you've called these things Lewis diagrams before. You might have called them something else. But the basic point of what we're after today is to draw a picture of something that looks as close as possible to a molecular structure. Now, if you've seen it before, what you've probably done is what I've got here as a subtitle is just connecting some dots. And there's a problem with that. It worked really well when you did it the first time, but there is a definitely a problem with that method that it doesn't work for everything. And there's a couple of problems, and we're going to illustrate the problem using sulfur dioxide. If you started this thing using the approach that you've used before, you would have started with the valence electrons. You would have counted up the valence electrons for six, for sulfur rather, and there are six, and there's also six for oxygen. You would have arranged those atoms with their valence electrons, and then you would have connected the dots, the single electron to a single electron, to make a full molecule. We run into a problem, though, in that there are still single electrons on each oxygen. Now, you might be thinking, or you might be tempted to say, well, just draw a line between those, connect a single electron to a single electron. And while on paper that meets the criteria of connecting the dots and single electron to single electron, the point is, or the problem is, that that is definitely not how that molecule exists. And if what we are trying to do is come up with a system of drawing diagrams that shows a picture of the molecule as close as possible to how it actually exists, then that method does not work. So what we need is some steps that do work. And there are going to be a few of them, and I strongly encourage you to write these down um, because you're going to need to refer to them until you get used to this. But you're going to count all the valence electrons. And you're also going to have ions, and ions that have a negative charge, that's an anion, mean that we've got more electrons. Ions that are a positive charge, a cation, have lost electrons. So we're going to add and subtract electrons as necessary. You're going to arrange the outer atoms around the central atom, which means we're going to need to identify a central atom. And you'll notice that we haven't put electrons on yet. We're just putting down the atoms, or at least the kernel of the atom. Then you're going to connect the electrons, so you're going to connect the outer atoms together or the other atoms to the central atom, I should say. And you're going to do that with bonds. And you're just going to put single bond, single bond, single bond. Every bond is two electrons. Then you're going to complete the octets of the outer atoms by adding electrons in pairs. I should pause here to say that not every single outer atom will have an octet, but most of them do. So rule number four stands as is. We'll just have to keep exceptions in the back of our mind. OK. In most cases, those four steps will cover it. However, not all cases. So we still might have to go to step number five, which is add remaining electrons in pairs to the central atom. Now, that is going to mean that we're going to have to get um, uncomfortable for a moment. And it's some, one of those things that we probably already know, but that's OK. We'll, we'll come to it when we get there. And you may actually need to go to a double bond. Now, I've emphasized the word if the central atom does not have an octet, then make double bonds. And the reason for that is a lot of people will go double bond crazy and they put double bonds everywhere. And even though sometimes double bonds are possible, if I think that you're doing them without knowing why you're doing them, I will penalize you for that. OK, counting valence electrons. We use a periodic table. And I'm not going to say much more about it than that, because if you don't know how to get the number of valence electrons from a periodic table, this is not the right video for you to be watching. You need to go some earlier one. All right, but let's try that out. If I gave you a couple of examples and asked you to come up with how many total valence electrons there are on these things, uh, I would second suggest you pause the video for a second so you can count those out. And we'll come back to it in a moment. Hopefully, you pause the video. And then you've counted up the valence electrons, and we can compare our answers. So this is what I have. You'll notice that on a couple of them, I did have to add or subtract electrons as necessary based on the ionic charge. And I also want to take this time to point out the chemistry thing of everything is backwards, where if we want to have a negative charge in something, that means we are adding. And if we have a positive charge, that means we're subtracting. And that's going to take some getting used to. OK, central atom was our next thing, was putting the outer atoms around our central atoms. So how do I know which one the central atom is? Mostly it comes down to experience, but there are a few things that are going to help you along the way. Number one is it's often, or at least sometimes, the first atom is written. If you look at a good chunk of those ones 
that were on the previous page, some of them were going to be the central atom. Unless it's hydrogen, we almost always write hydrogen first, and it will never, ever, ever be the central atom, so we don't need to worry about hydrogen. If there's only one of that type, good chance that it's going to be the central atom, and then the other atoms will be arranged around it. And if it's the least electronegative element, that's also usually a pretty good clue, or at least a good pattern, that that thing would be a good choice for a central atom. Now, we don't necessarily have a table of electronegativities with us, so we're going to be kind of working with the trends in the periodic table is a little bit further away from that upper right-hand corner. Okay, if I give you some examples and ask you to pause the video again and identify the, the central atom in these, uh, we'll come back in a moment and check it out. Okay, so again, hopefully you pause the video and you uh, have identified the central atoms and here's what I'm coming up with. In the top one, sulfur is likely to be the central atom and followed by phosphorus, chlorine, and xenon. Now we haven't seen xenon in too many compounds and you're going to see some noble gases. I know you've been told that they don't react. They don't react very often, they don't react very well, but there are some compounds of those noble gases, and I like to use them, and we'll see why in a little bit. Okay, so that gives us all the background, so let's now work with drawing the actual Lewis diagram for these things. I'm gonna take sulfur tetrafluoride. I'm gonna count up all the valence electrons. Gonna use my periodic table to help me out. I end up with 34 valence electrons. I have to have 34 valence electrons when I'm done. By the way, there are two things that I look for mainly. Number one is that you have, your diagram has all the valence electrons. Second thing is that all the electrons are going should be in pairs. Those are my two key things to look for. After that, whether the diagram is perfectly correct or not, where we're at right now, I can give you some leeway on that, but counting valence electrons, non-negotiable. Then you're gonna arrange the outer atoms around the central atom. Based on what we've done before, based on the things that we know already, sulfur is my likely candidate for a central atom, which means my fluorine atoms are gonna go around that. I haven't got any electrons down yet. That becomes the next job, is I'm gonna connect the outer atoms to the central atom with a two electron bond. Not two bonds, not a double bond, just a single bond, but each single bond represents two electrons. So it starts to look like that. That, keeping score with my electrons, is eight electrons, two in each bond. Then I'm gonna complete the octets of those outer atoms, the fluorine atoms, by adding electrons in pairs. You'll notice the theme. So I have that. I put complete the octets around, not forgetting to count the two electrons that are already in the bond. And of course, because it's a shared bond, each atom counts the, that pair of electrons that is in the bond. So counting up where I'm at so far, I'm at 32 electrons. Now you would look at that and say, yep, everything is done. Octets around the fluorines, octet around the sulfur. The problem is I had 34 electrons to take care of which means I need to go to that rule number five, which is add remaining electrons in pairs to the central atom. And if you're thinking, wait a second, octet rule, I need to pause here because the octet was never a rule. It was never a law, even though I've heard that phrase used. Octet, every atom gets eight electrons, is a pattern that we notice in a lot of places, but is definitely not a rule or a law or something that can never be broken. You've gotta get 34 electrons on this particle. You better find a way to do it. So I add them in pairs to the central atom. Now I'm at 34 electrons. Everything is good. If we try something similar with this one, sulfur dioxide, this is where we started, right? We had a problem with sulfur dioxide. We haven't solved it yet, so let's work on that now. We already know about the number of valence electrons on this one because we've already counted them up. Uh, I've got one sulfur and two oxygens, that's not two times zero, and that would give me 18 electrons. I'm gonna arrange them around the central atom. We have already know what that's gonna be because we saw an earlier picture of that before. So now we're gonna work toward connecting the, the not connecting the dots, but connecting the atoms in the molecule in a proper way. So I've got my four electrons taken care of by the bonds. I'm gonna complete the octets of the, central, the, of the outer atoms, just like I did before, and now I've got a total of 16 electrons. Okay, well, we know what to do because we did it in the last example. We complete the octets, or we add electrons around the central atom now to finish it off the count, 
and here I have M. You'll notice that the oxygen uh, electron arrangement is a little bit unexpected, and like we don't have uh, those single electrons anymore. Now my electron counting is done, but I run into a problem. And that problem is that last rule, rule number six, was if the central atom does not have a stable octet yet, and this one does not, sulfur in this case only has six valence electrons around it, so it does not have an octet. So the job then is to go with multiple bonds. So I take an electron, pair of electrons from one of the oxygens in a non-bonding arrangement, and I move them into a bonding position. Does it matter which pair I use? No. Does it matter which oxygen I use? No. Could be from the left one, could be from the right one, top, bottom, doesn't really matter. Now what's likely going to happen is the real situation is going to be slightly more complicated than this, but at this point what we have is 18 electrons on our structure, outer atoms have stable octet, the central atom also has an octet. Central atom can sometimes go over an octet, it's less common for it to be less than an octet, there are some cases where that happens. We're going to try to avoid those though so that we can focus on this. Okay, I'm going to leave you with some to try. We'll probably, next time we see each other, we'll probably have these as our, our starting point uh, and then you can um, show me what you can do. Okay, so I'm going to get you to pause and write those down, otherwise uh, you have to rewind a little bit, but we're going to talk about what you should be able to do with this stuff and that is basically draw Lewis diagrams but all the things involved in Lewis diagrams. Okay. I'm going to go back here because you might still be working on it and we'll talk to you another time.